Well, thank you very much for having me here and uh, that we have the opportunity to present our preliminary data on the high-risk uh, Dutch-German uh, MRD study. Um, Um, this is a protocol that has been um, uh, started s some years ago and Janine Stutterham was the first PhD student that worked on this, uh, Esther van Wezel II and Lieke van Zogel will finalize it, but I uh, am allowed to present to you the preliminary data. Um, being a clinician and also working in a lab, I always have the question, uh, what am I investigating? Will it also be applicable to my patients? So I always have the patients in mind that, that they come in and then you take the bone marrow and look at it and what, what will we learn from it? So we have a very relevant clinical question. So we say, um, if we study um, mineral residual disease, uh, can we use this to identify the patients that will uh, survive the treatment or the patient that will not survive the treatment. As 50% of the patients in complete remission, as we think, MIBG negative, MRI negative, bone marrow negative, they still will have recurrent disease. We do not identify these. So can we identify the patients that will um, suffer from recurrent disease? Um, and also during therapy, can we improve the response me measurement? So if the bone marrow is clear of disease, is it really clear of disease or is there still minimal residual disease left? Um, and if the patients uh, become clear of disease fast, is this correlating with outcomes? Or are these the patients that do survive and the patients that do not uh, clear their bone marrow? Are these the patients we need other therapies for? And can we identify the patients that will have recurrent disease in the end? Um, when we started this project, Alexander already told us we were looking for uh, uh, RNA markers and we uh, discovered that FOX2B uh, was the first specific uh, messenger RNA that identified neuroblastoma. Um, we also uh, uh, designed a panel of markers and said that uh, uh, using a panel of markers you're more sensitive to detect neuroblastoma messenger RNA. And in a retrospective analysis we said if you clear your bone marrow early you have a better chance to survive. So to prove this to the clinic and to be able in the future to make it a clinical test we have to demonstrate that it holds true in a prospective manner. So we went to the German colleagues and we said, we have a very good idea, we have a nice panel of markers, can we study this in Europe patients? Because as has been said, neuroblastoma is a rare disease and we have 30 new patients in the Netherlands a year. So if we would do it on our own, it would take many, many years. So the German colleagues said, well, yeah, good idea, let's do it together. So we started our prospective study. Uh, we took bone marrow and blood samples between 209 and 2017 uh, and we looked in the PAX gene, we stored them in PAX gene tubes and we, did, uh, we extracted an RNA from that. Uh, in the meanwhile, the clinical samples were tested with GD2, so we have a combined uh, PCR and GD2 uh, selected bone marrow samples. So the treatment protocol, I think, is, is quite familiar to most of you. So the German study was at that time studying uh, the standard induction, so the NB204 study uh, and five and six courses, um, the SEM high-dose chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and this was retinoic acid at the time. And they compared it in a uh, randomized fashion to two times N8, followed by the standard arm. In the Netherlands, we had the same uh, therapy. Uh, some, we, we used to start with two times MIBG, but we stopped that study uh, because we didn't have too many patients to include. Um, like I said, we have a whole panel of RNA markers, so these are the five markers that we test. Um, and we demonstrated that if you use more markers than only TH and FOX2B, your panel is more sensitive in detecting tumor. Um, but we also wanted to know how do you call a marker positive or negative in the bone marrow. And for this we tested um, 
control bone marrow samples and control blood samples. So these are bone marrow and blood samples for, from healthy volunteers or patients with other diseases, but they do not have neurostoma. Most of these samples are from uh, patients with leukemia in complete remission six months after end of therapy. Um, then we took an, a control sample and uh, these samples are leukemia negative from, from children. And we tested these for our whole panel of markers. And we tested peer for blood stem cells um, of do healthy donors, so adult donors that give the stem cells for brothers and sisters, um, and peer for blood samples from the blood bank. So first we looked, for example, FOX to be the expression in primary tumor, and then we saw that in all of these control samples there is no expression of FOX to be. So from from this we can learn that FOX to be is a specific neurostomal marker. For TH, we saw that there is expression in normal bone marrow cells, normal PBSCs, and normal blood cells. So if in a patient sample we would have a CT value of this, we would not know is this expression in, in normal cells or is it neuroblastoma. So we made cutoff levels. And we said below this level it's negative, so we can, if we test a patient sample, it's negative. Uh, if b b above this uh, threshold, we find CTs, we know it is neuroblastoma, it is positive. And if it's in between this uh, region, we don't know if it's positive or negative because it's expression in normal cells, it's, it's a legitimate expression, so we call it inconclusive. Oh, sorry. With all these, um, for all these markers, we, we tested the thresholds of positivity. So we, pu we published this and we said, uh, if you are above this uh, threshold, then we know it is positive and there's neurostoma cells in there. <coughs> so we have now positive, negative, uh, and with the, seed, with the uh, immune cytology, we will have percentage of tumor invasion. So how do we uh, also score a bone marrow sample? Because we don't only, only want to say it's positive or negative, we all also want to have a, a sense of how much a tumor is in there. So first we say positive, negative. Then for all the samples that are positive, we take the CT value and we do this according to uh, the um, IMER32. So this is an external um, standard. So this is a, a cell line that we cultured like in, in kilograms and we took RNA for that. So we have messenger RNA for 10 years or something. Um, and we um, test the expression of the levels of the markers in the IMR32. So we uh, p uh, take the um, uh, mean value um, of all the uh, markers that are positive in the bone marrow sample, and we do it according to the IMR32. And like that, we can say which percentage of tumor is in the bone marrow. So this is for the PCR. So we say no infiltration, 0.1% uh, infiltration, 1 to 10% and above 10%. And we will compare this in the, in the end to the GD2 uh, immune cytology. And there they have different cutoffs, uh, zero point, so negative 0 0.1 to 1 to 10, 10 to 30 and more above 30. And sometimes they find some GD2 positivity, but are not sure is it um, uh, something in the mi macrophage, um, so it has a macrophage engulfed neurostoma cell or something. So then they call it inconclusive. Um, so here the, are the first uh, results of the um, uh, uh, SIP analysis, and we identified 280 high risk neurostoma patients with at least a sample at diagnosis after two courses of induction and end of induction, so before the megatherapy. The idea for the megatherapy is that there are, is no tumor or minimal tumor left, so you will clear the bone marrow of the rest of the tumor. So from this cohort, we had uh, PCR uh, samples tested at the different time points. Um, and um, these are the patient characteristics of the study. Uh, so these are all high-risk patients from the Netherlands and from Germany, uh, the MIG and amplification, um, and the age of diagnosis. So if we look at diagnosis and we see um, the level of infiltration according to our PCR, you can see that if you have a high level of infiltration, the event-free survival is worse. Um, 
and this is uh, significantly correlated with poorer outcome. So at diagnosis, if you have a high level of uh, tumor burden, your outcome is, is poorer than if you have a low level of tumor burden. But for this, I think we don't need PCR because I think with immune cytology, we will find the same results. If we look uh, for the overall survival, uh, we find the same, that a uh, high level of tumor burden correlates with poor outcome at diagnosis. If we look after uh, two cycles, so the, uh, the early induction time point, uh, we see that if the PCR um, um, uh, becomes uh, negative or uh, um, above 0.1 percent, the outcome is better. So from this we can conclude if you have more than 0.1 percent tumor infiltration after two courses, your outcome is worse in inventory survival. Uh, so this means that the patients that clear their bone marrow early, so if you have an early good response, so after only two courses, uh, you have a better EFS. Um, at the moment for the OS, it is still uh, not uh, conclusive, but we think um, if we wait longer or we will uh, in include more patients, uh, this will be the same because the trend is really there. At end of therapy, before the, st before the high dose chemotherapy, uh, if you clear your bone marrow of, um, of tumor, um, you have a, a better outcome. So if there is still PCR positivity, uh, the, the outcome is really uh, poorer than uh, if you do clear the bone marrow with the PCR. And for the overall survival, it is the same. Uh, if you cl clear your bone marrow after uh, end of end, uh, therapy, uh, so before the high dose chemotherapy, the outcome is better. Um, so these are the five years EFS and OS for the, for the whole cohort with uh, a diagnosis and end of induction uh, rated to according to the PCR positivity. So this really correlates with outcome. Uh, our PCR MRD test. So this is very nice, but how does this correlate with the uh, immune cytology uh, that has been tested in uh, Germany? So we were very fortunate also to have the CD, uh, the GD2 uh, cytology results that have been tested in Cologne. So we did not do it ourselves. Cologne was a center that tested it for the whole of Germany and also for our patients. And in this slide, we see that there is not a good correlation between uh, immune cytology and PCR. So on the horizontal axis, we see uh, immune cytology negative patients uh, zero, uh, smaller than 0 0.1 percent, 1 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 100, and these are the questionables. And on the vertical axis, we have the qPCR um, percentage according to the IMR32. Um, and well, we were not really surprised, but we see that immune cytology negative patients have a median of one, um, it's a log scale um, uh, PCR. So there are many, many patients that are PCR positive and immune cytology negative. Uh, again, one, once more um, stating that PCR is more sensitive in detecting a tumor derived something, as a messenger RNA, whatever you're looking at, than just looking at the cells. Um, and that, uh, in, indeed, when there's a really high level of infiltration uh, with the cytology, uh, there is a correlation with the PCR. But even the questionable um, patients, so where there was GD2 positivity, but they were not sure it was tumor or it was just um, something in a mi macrophage that has been engulfed, there is also a lot of uh, PCR positivity in there. So if we look at the diagnostic time point with the uh, cytology, uh, we see that there is a, oh, sorry, there is a trend um, that the higher the infiltration is, the, the poorer your outcome is, but this, this is not statistically significant. Um, and if we look after uh, end of induction, so the t time point before the megatherapy, uh, we see that um, if the bone marrow is still uh, positive, there is a correlation with outcome. So um, if you're negative, questionable, or uh, below 1%, uh, the outcome is, is poor. Um, and this is, um, oh yeah, sorry. Um, 
But we wondered um, what, would, would be, what, what would happen if we would look at the PCR uh, um, testing of these samples. So we looked in the patients that were negative and questionable and we had the PCR outcome of that. So here are the PCR results for the, um, the, the questionable patients. So if you are if questionable and you are PCR negative, you have a much better outcome. But if the test was questionable and the PCR is positive, then your outcome is really much, much uh, poorer. So this, so we can divide this arm into two arms um, that are uh, but PCR negative and PCR positive. Yeah, sorry, Alexander, it, you can't really see it on that screen. You. So, um, so it, with the PCR, we can divide uh, the cytology uh, questionables. Uh, and what about the P, the um, n the negatives? So, if I go back, so if you were negative by cytology, um, and then we look at, sorry, then we will look at the PCR. Then you can see if you are negative by cytology and PCR negative, you have a better outcome. But if you are negative with cytology but PCR positive. Uh, you are, the outcome is as bad as, as um, cytology positive. So PCR really can subdivide the cytology negative arms in patients with a, a good outcome and a, and a worse outcome. So in this uh, way we, we demonstrate that PCR uh, adds really a valuable uh, outcome to, for these patients. So the over survival we did the same. Uh, you have um, the patients that are negative. Um, and um, if we dis subdivide these patients uh, to the questionables PCR negative, you see that they have an uh, over survival of 100%. And if we have the PCR uh, negative uh, positive questionables, the, uh, really the outcome really drops. And if we do this for the patients that are uh, uh, cytology negative, we see that the PCR positivity, uh, negativity really is, is doing better than the PCR positivity. So also for the oval survival, if we add the PCR, uh, the outcomes are much more clearer. So concluding from this, we see that high levels of bone infiltration and diagnosis are associated with a poor outcome. Um, that bone marrow infiltration after two cycles, if you are below 0.1%, correlates with a much better outcome. Uh, clearance of the bone marrow end of induction um, is associated with a, a really significant better EFS and OS. Um, and bone marrow infiltration estimated by qPCR um, combined with immune cytology is uh, predicting much better the outcome than immune cytology alone. Um, and um, in the multivariate analysis, it is not included in this uh, um, uh, presentation. The qPCR is really significant in demonstrating the outcome for these patients. With that, I think the whole team that really worked on this, because uh, it's a joint effort, um, and I all invite you to the ANR in Amsterdam, uh, because we'll hear much more uh, neurobastoma work in there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Livy, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, please, Ina from uh, uh, Belarus. Thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, do you have some clarification? Positive PCR for all markers or only for folks to be? Now, these are uh, all the markers are positive. So it can all be uh, that five markers are positive in a sample. It can be that three are positive. So if we say PCR positive, it's for all the markers are positive. For all markers. Yeah. But we did. At, yeah, at least one. Yeah. One or more. Yeah, one or more. And we did the sub analysis. We are still working on it. And we see that uh, Fox to be on its own is mostly demonstrating PCR positivity. Thank yeah. You. Thank you for a very great talk. And I've got two questions, if I may. One Do you think? Uh, the PCR is great, but it's not available anywhere. May it be comparable with flow cytometry data? 
So you even you use the chemistry is also great, but not available everywhere. But flocetometry is common. With, with leukemia, we have flocetometry. Is it comparable? Um, I think we will hear a talk on flocetometry later on from Alexander. Um, it's, it's a good question. We, um, in J. Katrineburg, Alexander and his team looked at the PCR and the flow cytometry, and they use RFOX to be in our panel. Um, and you published, I think, a year ago, two years ago, that um, um, actually flow cytometry is good. Um, and that in the same cohort, if you test PCR and flow cytometry, you see other, other patients are being identified. So it's good, and but it does sometimes there are PCR negative and flow cytometry positive and the other way around. So I'm not going to sure how much you're going to tell, but maybe we have to discuss this after his talk. Okay, thank yeah. you. And another one. You've stopped at the most interesting point. So you've given the lab data, but what should we do with these MRD positive patients from clinical point yeah. of view? Yeah, yeah. So um, in our experience, we had some experience with low cytometry, and um, it turned out it there seemed to be a mark of uh, therapy resistance. So flow cytometry positive patients tend also to have some MIBG positive lesions. Small residual, but they did have a bright uh, autologous transplant. And our tactics was to give them two additional courses of some uh, second line chemo, topatikin or inotikin, um, something. And um, at first it was disappointing, but uh, only this year we started to get some meaningful difference between patients who did respond by clearing all MMG positive disease and who did not. So maybe, may this uh, MRD be an indication for additional chemo? Yeah. or some immune therapy, what's happening? Well, this is a very good and very relevant question, uh, because if we can identify the patients that do not do well, how to, to work on that, what can we give them? Uh, the answer is not a simple one. We are studying currently also MRD next to the response in MRBG, so we will look at the whole panel. Uh, in the retrospective analysis, we saw that MRD was uh, better than MRBG and other uh, techniques, so it was independent marker, so even MRBG was negative, MRD positive, still positive, worse outcome. Um, the European group and the German group also demonstrate that adding extra chemotherapy will not increase the um, outcome of these patients. So they didn't look in sub-analysis according to the MRD, uh, but the large studies say more chemo is not the solution, but what else to do? Um, so I think we will learn this um, in the future study and in also our analysis. So maybe these are the patients uh, that need also the combination of uh, anti-GD2 with the chemotherapy. So maybe these are the patients that we can help uh, with that way, or these are the patients that might have the elk or the turd or so. So we, we don't know yet what are the characteristics of these patients, uh, but if once we can identify these, uh, we can see which alternative therapies there are in there. So I think I, I would agree with you now that extra chemotherapy would be an option. Um, but if I, in, in the future trials, I would uh, I identify these patients and start with immune therapy combined with chemotherapy in, in, in new protocols. That would okay. be my uh, way forward. For German okay. uh, sorry, sorry, we have to go forward. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> 